15th Sunday after Trinity, the Collect, let us pray. Keep, we beseech thee, O Lord, thy church with thy perpetual mercy. And because the frailty of man without thee cannot but fall, keep us ever by thy help from all things hurtful, and lead us to all things profitable to our salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The epistle is from the sixth chapter of the epistle of St. Paul the Apostle to the Galatians, beginning with the 11th verse. You see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Here endeth the epistle. The Holy Gospel is written in the sixth chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew, beginning with the 24th verse. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, be not anxious for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than the food and the body than the raiment? Behold the birds of the heaven, that they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, and your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are not ye of much more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add one cubit unto the measure of his life? And why are ye anxious concerning raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God doth so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Be not therefore anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Be not therefore anxious for the morrow, for the morrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. You know, today's gospel is especially challenging to read during this, this time that we're in, you know, when uh, the numbers are starting to pick up and life is starting to get back to normal and then we get hit with this other thing called the Delta variant and it seems like our patience is being tested, our faith is being tried like never before. But I still say that I, I find great comfort in this passage. And I look at the solution as being what Jesus says near the end. Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness. 
where it says in the King James, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. What does it mean to seek the kingdom of God? Uh, does not mean, it's not talking about going to heaven as Sunday school teachers might tell you. The kingdom of God is not just something that's future. In the future, it will be complete. It will rule all the universe. The whole cosmos will be subject to only the rule of God and, and death will be conquered. Christ has already taken away our sins. He's already risen from the dead. He's already the first fruits of them that slept. He'll come again in glory. And the, all the dead shall be raised and his kingdom will rule forever without end. But the kingdom of God will, has already been put in the earth. When you read in the book of Daniel about the fourth king that would arise, the fourth kingdom or empire that would arrive, arise, in the time of there was Babylon, Greece, and, and Rome uh, was, and he says in the time of those kings, the Lord will establish a kingdom that will crush all the others, it will never end. And really, when Jesus came to earth, it was during the time of the reign of the Caesars. And it was during the time of that, that beast of, whose feet were mixed of iron and clay. During the time of that empire, the Lord set up his kingdom in the earth. And it is present, it is active, and we are to seek it even though right now it appears only to those who have been born again or born from above. No one else can see it. To seek his kingdom and his righteousness. His righteousness in two ways as he declares us righteous in his son who has died and taken our sins away and risen from the dead and also in obedience to him. It is very easy to lose sight of his kingdom and that's when we lose faith. That's when we're discouraged. That's when we forget who it is we trust in. Jesus doesn't say here, nobody should try to serve two masters. He doesn't say here, I forbid you to serve two masters. He says very simply, no man can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon, as uh, my studies have, have brought me to see, was, the, was actually a name. It was a god of money. But the uh, worship uh, first, probably in Syria. And uh, it, it's this whole concept of making, making material wealth the most important thing, the ultimate goal, the thing that matters most. And our society does that. It really does. It, it is quite obvious to me that we have it very backwards in our society. The whole concept of an economy should be that it serves the needs of the people. That you put in your efforts and your neighbors put in, put in their efforts and, and everyone is thereby contributing to, if they're able and provided for and so forth. It is something where the purpose is to put food in your mouths and housing and all these things you need. And yet we live in a time when there's an engine driving things where the economy is to be served by people, not for the sake of people, but as if it was a God, as if it was God, as if nothing is more significant. I'm going to say something. I, I find it very troubling that many people who might be here this morning have to work. And I don't, I don't fault the people who have to work. That's not my point. But the fact that 
oh, starting really in the 1980s, you know, we couldn't even stop one day or for people to give their attention to God and everything just has to grind on and on and on and on and on all the time. And this does not honor God. It doesn't give him a day. He wants one in seven. You know, it's in the Ten Commandments, keep holy the Sabbath day. There are two commandments in the Decalogue that I have discovered most Christians pay no attention to or they think they don't count anymore. One is, thou shalt keep holy the Sabbath day, which for us is the eighth or first day of the week when Christ rose from the dead and everything became new. Keep holy the Sabbath day. The other is, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. I have seen that uh, most Christians, uh, if they observe that one, Let's put it this way. Those who realize that they're not supposed to bear false witness against their neighbors seem to be in the uh, minority. We have seen people who try to serve God and mammon. All you got to do is look at these preachers on TV. You know who I mean. The ones with the... Uh, multi-million dollar mansions and their fleet of airplanes and they, they, they soak money from poor gullible people by promising them if you give me a dollar God will give you ten if you give me ten he'll give you a hundred and people who are poor in their desperation to escape they, 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 they send money they can't afford to these TV preachers who are wealthy they're wolves in sheep's clothing is what they are. And uh, they're a bad witness. They, uh, many people look at them and they unfortunately blaspheme the name of God because of the, the way they see this hypocrisy on the part of these people. And that's because they pretend they can serve God and mammon. You can't. You just can't. Anxiety is indeed what Jesus is talking about here. I, I'm going to say, to be anxious for tomorrow. Now, this is the only place in the whole book of common prayer where instead of the King James Bible, they used the, what was called uh, at the time, the American Standard Version. It was a revised version in 1898, I believe it was. And they replace the words, take no thought for the morrow with be not anxious for tomorrow. Don't have anxious thoughts, which is indeed what he's saying. Uh, I've often thought about what makes people greedy or covetous. And I, maybe in some cases it's just avarice, just a lust to have as much as possible. But in a lot of cases it may be fear Someone just so afraid of not having enough to make ends meet that he's willing to be greedy and to, and to, uh, to engage in those kinds of sins that you will not engage in if you are able to trust God for tomorrow. Now, as a Christian, trusting God for tomorrow shouldn't be that strange because here's what it... We, we look forward to, we look forward to everything depending on a miracle yet to come that has been promised to us. The miracle yet to come that has been promised to us is the resurrection of the dead on the last day and life in God's kingdom and the age to come that can never end. We have not only the promise, but a token in that Christ himself is risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Now, if you're not anxious for eternity, then why are you anxious for tomorrow? Why are any of us anxious for tomorrow when we say we believe that we will live and reign with Christ forever and ever? Uh, the big tomorrow, if we have faith, is already solved. It's already settled. It's already guaranteed. 
And therefore, any anxiety is something that we should be able to put to rest, to quiet, to drive out of our system. Learning to pray, perhaps, as the psalmist prayed, just very frank statements to God about what is truly going on in one's life and in heart. And, and when I have anxieties, for I can admit right now I'm not free of all that myself. I've learned to pour out my heart to God as the psalmist. And, and then I find comfort and I find peace. You can't serve two masters. Another reason you can't is because it takes faith in God, knowing that he'll provide for you, for you to both give to his church and to do good works and give to the poor. This takes faith that produces charity, that produces good works. So all of these things are connected, and that's very much a part of the larger text of the Sermon on the Mount especially chapter 6 that this is from. The key, again, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Know that he is the one who rules. Know that he is the one we obey, no matter what the rules and laws of the world are. Our highest allegiance is to our king, which is Jesus Christ. And that his kingdom has already begun to prevail. And that we must seek that. We must seek to be part of that now. We must see it now. And never lose sight of it through eternity. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Now to God the Father, God the Son... And God, the Holy Ghost, be ascribed as his most justly do all might, majesty, dominion, power, and glory, henceforth, world without end. Amen. 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 The Lord be with you.